Okay, so uh, let's begin. It's, it's, it's a slightly long session with three speakers. So uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, for the uh, evening, afternoon, morning session uh, of the discussion meeting. We, we have uh, three talks uh, in this session, and we begin with the KPV equation, and who better to tell us about the many facets of this than Herbert Schwann from the Technical University of Munich. So Herbert, over to you. And again, uh, you know, you can send in your questions. We'll try to take them together at the end of Herbert's talk. But if there's something really pressing, we will, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll interject. Herbert, floor is yours, screen is yours. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this introduction. And um, I feel very honored and very happy that uh, I can participate in this meeting for celebrating short shows achievements. Um, so I will be talking about uh, the KPC equation. I mean, that's a very, very highly cited uh, piece of work. And uh, of course, uh, the motivations to actually study the equations are extremely diverse. I mean, th th that's one of the reasons why there are so many citations. I mean, many people found this equation for various reasons interesting. And what I will try to do, uh, that's sort of somehow what the facets should say in my title, I sort of try to explain you, sort of give you a little bit of flavor. I mean, why, why this is sort of a fascinating, sort of uh, 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 fascinating equation to look at. And so let me sort of uh, go back to the origin. Ah, so here I put a timeline, I mean, so that you can follow a little bit uh, what I'm talking about, because, you know, there will be sort of more like a uh, of course, I have a particular plan, but you know it will not follow you know exactly the timeline. But uh, you know I will start. I mean with uh, the origin, and then there sort of I will jump back and forth. You know what happened, and it's a personal selection, sort of you know one of the things which I love most. Okay, so the origin is uh, is a famous uh, KPC paper on dynamical scaling of growing interfaces, which was written in in, in 1986. And uh, at the time, of course, uh, you know, it was considered to be an equation which uh, could be in any spatial dimension. Uh, but uh, in fact, most of the work, I mean, and all the kinds of things I'm going to explain will be uh, in one plus one dimension. So there's one space dimension and one time dimension and, uh, you know, sort of uh, higher dimensions have to wait for some other talk. Okay, so now let me let me go back to, to what uh, George's original problem was. I mean, he mentioned this briefly this morning, but uh, uh, let me just sort of uh, put it sort of slightly more into focus. So this was, you know, high time of disorder systems, mid sixties, uh, spin classes, all these kind of things. And and so George was thinking also about dynamical problems with uh, with uh, uh, randomness. And one of the problems was, uh, you know, it's very easy to describe. I mean, you take a random potential. Since I'm doing one plus one dimension, I mean, we are actually uh, uh, in the plane, and there's some random potential which is sort of essentially, sort of, you know, uh, I mean, essentially uncorrelated, uh, sort of random, uh, sort of attractive or repulsive potentials. And uh, of course, you know, the polymer will sort of try to reach its lowest energy, and there will be a particular configuration or maybe various configurations and uh, will of course depend on the, on the, it's a frozen randomness, okay? And now the question he was asking is what happens to this polymer when I, uh, uh, when I exert a uniform force onto the polymer? And of course, if the force is very small, I mean, then, you know, the polymer will sort of uh, arrange, but the force will be not strong enough to overcome, you know, the, the, the wells of the random potential. And so when you look at the diagram, where you, uh, where you plot the velocity of, of the polymer against the force. I mean, then first you will see for a while that it's just sort of being completely flat. I mean, it just doesn't move, but then there will be a critical forcing and from that forcing onwards, there will be a, a positive velocity. So this is the problem which you wanted to solve. And of course, the most interesting part is, you know, to understand what happens close to the critical forcing. Uh, but this turned out to be, a, you know, not, not such an easy problem. And, and uh, then uh, 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 George realized that uh, there's at least sort of one aspect of the problem, you know, where you could simplify, and that's how he sort of wrote down his equation. So let me, so, so now we are looking at, at the situation where, uh, you know, the, 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 this uh, uh, polymer or, or interface, well, let's say a polymer is sort of uh, moving already with a net velocity. And the, the, the crucial, one crucial observation is that 
um, uh, you know, because it's now moving, it will see all the time sort of a different part of the frozen environment. But since we assume that this to be independent, what the polymer will actually feel is a space time white noise. Okay. Now, step number two in the simplification is that, uh, you know, the polymer, of course, you know, will, might have overhangs, sort of more complicated shape than what I have drawn. But, you know, maybe this doesn't, now that's not so important. And let's assume that, you know, the polymer actually can be described as a graph of, of a function. So, so there are no overhangs. And now we have a, a single valued height function, which depends on the spatial coordinate. And of course, which is evolving in time. And, uh, you know, by the way, how we set it up, it will sort of uh, on average sort of uh, moving with a particular velocity, let's say upwards, okay. So we have learned two things already. I mean, one thing we need sort of an, an, a line object, which must have some intrinsic stiffness. I mean, you know, if I would leave out the stiffness, I mean, then, you know, it will sort of totally disintegrate. We wouldn't have any nice division anymore. And then uh, of course noise, I mean, that's what we talked about, but then there must be some mechanism how it's moving. Now, this is sort of a little bit left, uh, left open in the KPC equation, uh, you know, how one, sort of uh, 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 how, how the forcing is actually achieved. And, and what people mostly thought of sort of one natural idea is that, you know, they're sort of like their position. I mean, there's mass sort of coming from the top and it's sort of attaching to the current surface. We will see that, you know, that's only one, one possibility, but just, just to keep something in mind. Okay, so uh, and now we want to write down an equation. And so here it is. So now we have a time evolution of, of the height function and we write down a stochastic equation. So we, we argued already that the, the, the noise should be space time wide noise. So that's an X and an T and it's sort of, you know, uncorrelated in both arguments. We put already the surface tension that in that, on that uh, sort of modeling would be simply modeled by, by just by the Laplacian. But now the question is, how do we do the driving? Now, of course you could put a linear term like this but you know, then you just go to the moving frame of reference and, and, and nothing very interesting actually happening. And one of the really great insights of that original KPC paper is to understand that, uh, that there must be, uh, I mean, that, the non, that there must be a nonlinear term which sort of uh, will be, uh, you know, will be relevant for the, for, the, for, the dynamics, for the dynamics of the paper, which is sort of, of, the, of the interface and which, uh, you know, which, which has to be included. And uh, what they propose, I will come back to this in a second. They propose, uh, I mean, first of all, it must depend, uh, otherwise it would not be a height model. It must depend only on the gradient of H. Um, and uh, it must be some nonlinear function of the gradient of H. And uh, then, uh, you know, lacking other more, perhaps more detailed information, you hope that you get along with the simplest nonlinearity and you just put it quadratically like this. There's a coupling strength in front of which can have either sign, and that is the famous KPC equation written already in one plus one dimension. Okay, so let me just point out sort of you know, two, two general facts why, why it's an interesting object. First of all, it's stochastic evolution. I mean, that's of course very familiar in statistical physics, but nevertheless, I mean, you know, this is stochastic PDE. But more importantly, when you look at this equation and you sort of study this, I mean, then you find that no detailed balance is satisfied. You see in critical dynamics, uh, you know, there are lots of models uh, uh, sort of uh, which, which uh, Ginsburg landau type of series, uh, which of course are also uh, stochastic PDEs, but, uh, but in this case, you always have detailed balance satisfied. And here you have sudden equation, which naturally, you know, describes a natural physical object and which does not satisfy detailed balance. So we are really in the realm of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And the kind of things which you would, know, would like to know is sort of, you know, I mean, shape fluctuations, basically. I mean, you know, you want to know something about the statistics of, of, of the time evolving surface. So let me come back to, to a moment, uh, you know, explaining a little bit more about this nonlinearity. And one thing which people realized already at that time is that, well, you know, this is not such a simple object. Maybe we can get along with a more simplified description. I mean, that, that's sort of like, you know, the equilibrium statistical mechanics to sort of invent the icing model because, you know, it sort of has all the important features, but might be more accessible. And that's the same thing which, uh, which you have over here. And this, this discrete model is called, it's the acronym, which is TASEP, which is, you know, where it comes from is actually <laughs> unimportant at that stage. 
just call it Hasse, but the, the main point is that you now take an, a height function which lives on a lattice and where, where the local slopes are only plus minus one. So the, the blue line here is my height function. And now the growth mechanism is sort of, you know, I mean, of maximal simplicity. All what you say is that at random times you fill in local minima. So here, for instance, is, it would be a local minima and here is the clock is already running. You know, there's an exponential distribution and one sort of, the, you know, the clock rings. I mean, then you simply add sort of an extra uh, uh, square over here and etc. You know, at every point and you do this, to, you know, independently for each one of the added squares. So, so that, that's a very simple dynamics. And for this, you can understand where the nonlinearity comes from. You see, if I would start with initial conditions, which has, let's say, slope minus one, you know, then there's nothing to fill. I mean, so, so there, 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 there is no local minimum. I mean, so you will be just stuck and you will have a velocity which is equal to zero. But if I start with a zigzag curve, then there are lots of local minima and there are a lot of ways how I can uh, fill it. And therefore, if you are for this model, if you would sort of plot, um, you know, the, 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 the local velocity as a function of the local gradient, then it, you know, will sort of look like sort of an inverted parabola. And, uh, you know, the KPC equation, uh, you know, doesn't want to describe all these details or, you know, I mean, the fact that it's between plus and minus one, of course, is not present, but you see, it's just exactly this kind of nonlinearity, which was postulated in the original equation. Okay. And uh, I repeat again, I mean, you know, the, the, the crucial insight is that this kind of, it should be universal, but, you know, you really need a nonlinearity over here. All right, so now we have the equation and now uh, let's have a look at one of the models which, which are described by the equation. So this is sort of the famous uh, Eden Krauss model where, um, you know, you have somewhere a seat and then uh, you basically, you know, at the carbon surface, you, you randomly pick a point along the surface on, on possible surface size. I mean, this is what is sort of, uh, you know, uh, painted here in, in red. And, and uh, so, you know, this is sort of a somewhat complicated curve, which consists of partial arcs, and you just take uniform distribution on those, and then you add the extra sphere, and then you just keep going. And, you know, you just, uh, the computer, you know, has a lot of time, I and mean, they will just keep adding and adding. And if you wait after, you know, sort of depositing something like, like 10,000, uh, attaching 10,000 spheres, then you will get such kind of a picture. So you see that, you know, there's sort of a, a sort of a, sort of rather uniform density bulk, and, but then there's sort of a random surface and it's this random surface, which is described by the KPC equation. Now, the authors of this uh, plot, I mean, unfortunately, you know, uh, sort of left out one very important detail for the theoretical analysis. They didn't tell us where was the initial seed? I mean, maybe it's somewhere over here, but we really don't know. But you really need the, in order to make the comparison with the KPC equation, you really have to somewhere fix the origin. And let's say it's this particular point would be the origin. Then what the KPC equation describes is that if you go along the radial direction, so you go along this direction here, and then of course you see, you know, the surface, I mean, the, the, the edge of the cluster is sort of statistically fluctuating because you know it's it's a stochastic process which you are looking at here, and it's these 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 uh, stochastic uh, fluctuations which are described by the KPC equation. Of course, there are all these fine details which which are left out, and and uh, but the, the KPC equation, as we will see in more detail later on, will catch, uh, will cover the the, the 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 universal properties of of these fluctuations. So when you do the, you know a correct analysis of the fluctuations, you will find actually a result, which is a very, very good agreement with the KPC equation. Okay, so this just sort of give you, gives you a picture of what kind of things um, are described. And so let me come um, uh, to the next thing, which was sort of uh, sort of like 20 years later. So now, now we switch to 2011. And that's sort of, uh, I would say, the first time where we, we uh, 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 I mean, that's sort of the famous Sakiuchi liquid crystal experiment which is sort of the first time that I think we had sort of, you know, a, a very, very convincing, um, very confirmation of, 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 of uh, the predictions of the KPC equation. Of course, before you had, you know, a lot of comparisons with, with, with computer simulations, but I mean, there is still a difference between the computer simulations and an actual experiment in the lab. And so uh, the basis of, 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 of this experiment is, is a very beautiful observation, namely rather thinking of, sort of mass being deposited 
you really have an interface between a stable and a metastable phase. So here you see the local free energy. I mean, you know, here the, you have the metastable point and you have the stable point, and you simply attach, you know, the same material, uh, the stable and metastable phase. Now out here, the metastable phase, you know, is perfectly happy and will not change very much. Over here, the stable phase is also happy, but at the interface, you will quickly do a change from metastable to stable, and therefore the stable phase will invite the metastable phase. So that's exactly what, what is covered by the KPC equation. And the beautiful idea of this experiment is that you have no mass transport. All what is happening is that you sort of switch from metastable to stable. Now, how this is actually realized um, is then, uh, I mean, you have sort of, uh, you know, two parallel plates, which are sort of, you know, 12 microns apart. And in between you have a liquid crystal, which was sort of what light molecules, which are sort of aligned. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of, a, it's a little cell. I mean, you, you can put it, take it in your hand. I mean, you know, it's sort of a quite stable object. And um, now, uh, uh, Kazumasa Takeuchi, I mean, he talked a lot to the engineer. I mean, you know, he wanted to find, you know, a, a, a point in parameter space, you know, where you have a, a nice metastable state. And in fact, what he found that the, the best uh, uh, candidate was actually not really an equilibrium, was sort of non-equilibrium steady state, uh, which sort of is in a, in a sort of maintained by an oscillating field. But then nevertheless, I mean, you know, this kind of phenomenology uh, applies. And um, it's very easy to observe. I mean, you just put this under the microscope, it's like permission, then um, uh, the, this, the, the metastable phase will be sort of like gray. And then uh, the stable phase, um, uh, it does not transmit light and therefore it sort of appears black. So it's very easy to see. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and now what you want to do, I mean, this is what I was trying to tell you before. I mean, you go along one particular vagal direction. So, uh, you know, there you see sort of that, that the height, I mean, also sort of along this radial, I mean, there will, there will be a linear term because, you know, this, this uh, it's sort of uh, basically like an expanding circle. But then there will be fluctuations on top of this. And then these fluctuations are of order t to the one third. I mean, as predicted already in the original KPC paper, but in the meantime, there has been a lot of work on this. In fact, it, it's not only the size of the fluctuations, but all the statistics, the statistics of the fluctuations which have been predicted, actually uh, even proved in some cases. And um, uh, what was found is that it's actually uh, given by an object which has been um, uh, uh, which, which has been found already in a totally different context. And you see, this is one part of the fascination that, that uh, you know, in this equation, there appears suddenly something which people knew already, but, you know, there's simply a priori no reason why it should appear in that equation. This radio, this crazy rhythm distribution, I mean, this is a, a scalar random variable, which is sort of, you know, the, the fluctuating height. I mean, so this is a scalar random variable. Uh, was found by, by Tracy and Whitten when they were studying uh, Gaussian random matrices, which, uh, you know, when you look at the density of states, uh, so the Wigner matrices, and we look at the density of states, it's sort of like a semicircular, but they were interested in, in what, what is happening to, to the largest eigenvalue, you know, that's just sitting at the edge. And of course, it has a, a, a considerably freedom to actually sort of uh, move away from, from the edge. And, and what they find is that on a particular scale, what they proved actually is that that the distribution of that largest eigenvalue has sort of you know such kind of a shape uh, which is sort of slightly asymmetric and has a mean at uh, minus 1.77 and uh, i will show you you know uh, precise pictures but you know just sort of that you get a feeling and surprisingly this very particular distribution appears in the solution of the KPC equation with initial data, which people call the sharp batch initial data. So that you should think of sort of like a sharp needle, which is then eventually expanding and then sort of looks like, like a sort of a, a, a growing parabola, okay? Now, one thing I want to point out, which is very surprising at the time is that, that the mean is universal. I mean, if you learn statistical mechanics, you're always told, I mean, you know, stuff like the mean, but here that's not the case. You see, it's universal in the sense that when you look at the first, so this is a linear term, when you look at the first order correction to the height, then you will see this t to the one third times this coefficient minus 177. And since, you know, the experiment is still difficult, I mean, you can do, you know, maybe four or maybe 6,000 samples, but, you know, your, your data, data are limited. Actually, it's the mean, which is of the most significant, significant quantity, which you can compare with the experiment. This is 
true for the you know, what people call the the, the Gaussian unitary ensemble. There's also you know similar experiments for the, where you get instead of the, the unitary case you get the orthogonal case. But for this you have to take different initial conditions. Before I come to this, I mean let me just show you what what the results of the experiment are. So here you see. So, so you know, this is the metastable phase, and you start the experiment by just baking, you know, the, the laser pointer, sort of generating the seed of the stable phase, and then now you see it expanding in time, and then of course you can sort of do nice plots and, and sort of collect data uh, uh, along, uh, you know, uh, along the random surface. Okay, and uh, now you analyze the data. So this is now taking you know sampled from from all radial directions and, and you see how the endpoint is sort of fluctuating and then you see that here's the prediction which is the one which comes from the kpc equation and these dots are actually the experimental results so it's, you see it's still still a little bit shifted but uh, but uh, nevertheless i mean you know it's it's it's, it's uh, you know on that scale an extremely good agreement and here are sort of you know numerical simulations which were done much before the experiment and of course you see the same picture okay and uh, if you decide to start this flat initial condition so so rather than making a point seed i mean you, you take a line seed over here then this this will be sort of expanding in both direction and now you sort of focus your your, your uh, frame onto uh, you know the, the fluctuating interface then uh, you know you might think it's the same well, you know, it's, it's sort of roughly the same, but when you look at the precise details, it's not. And you see that in this case, this distribution is shifted slightly, and uh, it happens to be, you know, the distribution of, of uh, this random matrix of the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble um, uh, of the largest eigenvalues of the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Okay, and you see the same thing here in, in the numeric thing. Okay, so that was sort of one, uh, I think, um, important uh, step in, in um, the history of the KPC equation, and I guess I'm coming. Uh, I have to look at my time. I'm coming already to the to the next one, which is sort of 2019, which uh, is in a totally different context. Which again tells you, you know, why so many people are interested in that equation. So now we look at an isotropic Heisenberg chain. So here you have written down the Hamiltonian, sort of the standard Hamiltonian, which is an integrable system actually, and we want to look at thermal distribution. We could also take infinite temperature. I mean, that's fine enough. I mean, it would be good. okay. And we look at the spin-spin correlation in equilibrium, right? I mean, so this is the spin at the origin dynamically. I mean, and the, the, and the time evolution, of course, is the unitary time evolution generated by the HXXX Hamiltonian. So here you have the spin at the origin um, uh, uh, at time zero correlate with the spin at, at lattice side J at time T. And uh, what you, uh, you know, was first sort of guess, and anyway, so the story is a little bit uh, complicated, but, but the general belief is that this should be governed by a scaling function, which now has a, has a scaling exponent two thirds. So here I've just written down this uh, scaling form. But the main point is that, that, that this particular uh, um, scaling and also the, uh, the, the, the scaling function is actually predicted or is determined by the stationary KPC. So I have to tell you just in a few words what I mean by stationary KPC, otherwise you cannot sort of um, uh, understand what, what, what the statement exactly is. I mean, so, so uh, rather than looking at the height, I mean, you look at the slope, I mean, this I call U here. Now the height is moving all the time, but the slope is something which is statistically, you know, can be statistically stationary. I mean, if I run it for a long time, it will be statistically stationary. And then you realize that when you take for the initial conditions a white noise of, of variance one, variance two would be something different, but of variance one, and let's say this means zero, then uh, uh, this is in fact uh, a stationary solution. So when you look at it at, at some later time, you will see exactly the same statistics again. And for that stationary space time, stationary random field, you can look at the two point function. So that's u at x of type t, u zero. And that for large times actually uh, behaves, uh, has exactly the scaling form. And the claim is that the same scaling form can be seen in a sort of physically totally different context, namely the, the spin spin correlation function of the Heisenberg, of the isotropic Heisenberg ferromagnet. Now, now this is something which, which people, so I mean, there's a nice uh, sort of uh, article by Joel Moore. Um, he, he sort of, you know, 
went to the experts. I mean, the, the spin chain, of course, can be realized uh, experimentally. And, and they went back to the old data. And, and you see, you know, very good agreement with, uh, uh, with the KPC equation. Of course, you know, what people have done, I mean, one, one sort of uh, this idea came about. I mean, they try to check the prediction by numerics, either by density matrix renormalization group dynamics, which sort of is very well suited to do this time dependent, to design dependent simulations. But one which I like even more is that um, sort of like, you know, random unitary circuits. I mean, if you do actually uh, the six vertex model and, and, and you do, uh, uh, so this is sort of, uh, uh, you know, when you look at the transfer matrix, sort of like a Markov chain, but now you, in, you know, in the weights, I mean, you, you, you make the analytic continuation. So you get actually unitary uh, uh, transfer matrix. And then uh, this one, you, you, you can sort of simulate uh, extremely efficiently. You can also simulate the classical spin chain. I mean, this is what I have done with uh, Arbyshek and, 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 and people at the ICTS. I mean, this is sort of uh, um, uh, also an integrable case. I mean, the only point is that to make it integrable, you really cannot do just the sigma, the, the SS or the sigma sigma interaction, but you must have, to, you must take the, the logarithms of one plus, you know, the classical spins. And now you can simulate the classical spin model and, 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 and uh, you know, so you have three systems and, uh, well, I cannot show you the data on the neutron set ring, but I can show you the, the data on the numerics and the integrable spin chain. Of course, you get the same. Now, the point is that, you know, when you look at this function, it's not really so much different from a Gaussian. So you have to look rather hard in order to see the deviation. I mean, the tails are actually not quadratic, but, you know, not e to the minus x squared, but e to the minus x cubed. So, so, so the only way how you can see this, this, this KPC prediction, of course, is having the wide scaling exponent, but we, we are more ambitious. I mean, we actually want to see the scaling function, but the scaling function does not deviate too much from the Gaussian. So let me show you uh, what you what, what we see here. So here I, I have I have three plots for you. So uh, what what is continuous? This refers to uh, uh, so these are all logarithmic plots. Uh, so what con continuous? These are DMHRs, DMHRHG simulations. Uh, and um, uh, the discrete is this uh, sort of unitary uh, transfer matrix of the six vertex model. And this one is, uh, is the classical spin chain. And you see that, you know, they have sort of more or less the same precision. I mean, you know, of course, you know, here they have a very nice sort of quadratic where things fit very precisely. And then you see sort of, you know, that the tails sort of go down a little bit faster. And clearly, you know, if you would try to fit this to a Gaussian, I mean, it just wouldn't work, right? I mean, so you see the, 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 the when I extend the Gaussian from, from, from the curvature over here, it would be on this side. And this is sort of definitely below that curvature. And, uh, you know, the, the, the blue line is the actual prediction. You know, when, when you actually fill in the, the FKPC scaling function, then you see it sort of fits over the entire range of data. All right, so this, this was sort of, um, something um, which was, was actually quite recent that, and there was a lot of excitement about the fact that, um, you know, you, you can see KPC physics as people call it nowadays in, uh, uh, in quantum systems. I mean, you know, there are more examples, but this is sort of one, one very characteristic example. All right, now let's see. Um, ah, okay, so the next thing is that uh, we want to go a little bit more into the theory. And, uh, and, and one thing I want to show you, now we are sort of 2010. This was work by, by sort of three groups sort of more or less simultaneously. Uh, the group uh, around Corbin and, and, and Sasamoto and myself used actually uh, uh, exact solutions of the, of the, of the, of the TASEP or version of the RCEP model um, and uh, sort of did the scaling in order to get the result, which I'm going to describe, there is uh, Le Dussalon company, they actually used, um, so they came from the spin classes. I mean, they actually use replicas, right? I mean, so that, that's not, not quite so vigorous, but they somehow figured that using replicas, you can actually get, you know, the same exact result. And so now let me tell you what, what the result is. I mean, so you look at uh, uh, the KPC equation with, uh, with uh, sharp batch initial data, and so here you have to sharp edge initially and it will sort of expand uh, into a parabola, okay? So you, you will see, you know, minus uh, one over two T X squared or this one over here. And there will be fluctuations around it, okay? I will be shifted downwards and, uh, and uh, then there are fluctuations. 
So the fluctuations, we learned this already are of order t to the one third, but now you can also measure sidewards correlations and they are of order t to the two thirds, okay? Okay, so, so I'm just going to explain you the exact result uh, at one single point. I mean, so, you know, you look at these fluctuations. So I've subtracted here the parabola and this is sort of the, the fluctuating part. And I'm just sitting at X equal to zero. Okay, so I'm not, not, not looking at these correlations. So that's too complicated for such a short time. So I'm just looking at the height at the origin. I'm mean, looking at the solution of the KPC equation and I only register the height at the origin. And then the claim is that there's a generating function, which sort of looks a little bit unusual. It's e to the minus e of that fluctuating term. And uh, here you see that the one third scaling uh, appearing. And this particular uh, uh, and the average over, over the distribution at time t, uh, uh, that particular scaling, uh, I mean, that particular generating function can be written in terms of a determinant. And this determinant actually has this sort of a fairly simple structure. So first of all, you have PS. I mean, S is sort of the parameter of this generating function, which projects you onto the interval S to infinity. So that sort of appears here on both sides. Or, okay. And then there's a kernel, which sort of looks a little bit like, like you know, what you are used from, from free fermions. So you have sort of a Fermi distribution, and then, and, 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 uh, but the, the wave function which you have to put in is actually the area function. And then you have to integrate over, over all these translations. And it's this kernel which you have to plug in over here. Okay. Now this is of course, uh, I mean, from there on you have to sort of do it numerically, but, but uh, uh, what you can see very easily, uh, if you actually now take the scaling of this fluctuating part, and this was supposed to go, go like t to the one third. So I do the, the normalize it correctly. And then in, in fact, it will converge. I mean, you know, that's a mathematical proof that it will converge to the phase of distribution. Okay. As confirmed then through experiments or, or numerical simulations. And of course, you know, the expectation is that, that uh, you know, this distribution is universal in the sense that, you know, we have seen it in the experiment. We have seen it in other cases. I mean, then of course, you know, the, 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 the precise details of the equation of the KPC equation are not reproduced, but but this universal property is actually correctly predicted by the trace of it, uh, by the by the KPC equation. Okay. All right. So so now we have an exact solution. So you now we can sort of do even more. I mean, we can use the computer to really uh, plot the solution, and so we can sort of understand you know how this limit actually occurs. Right here, sort of just a sort of a more abstract result, and and uh, you know. You couldn't see this from the formula. So let, let, let's turn on the computer and see how this uh, solution actually evolves. And so this is sort of uh, what you find. I mean, so th this is a very early time. Uh, you know, then it's sort of, you know, nonlinearity had sort of no time to actually act. And, and so sort of essentially, you see sort of the initial Gaussian sort of, uh, I mean, you see the Gaussian noise. So that, that's a, a very good approximation of Gaussian. But then, you know, it sort of swings over. There's a little overswing. And then eventually it will go to, to uh, the trace of distribution, which is this blue line up here all the way, and then here it goes down. And you see that it has this characteristic mean, you know, which allows you to distinguish it from, from other possible candidates. And, um, um, uh, and, and now you see also the convergence. I mean, you see that's sort of what the conversion, but the theorem states that, you know, it's not only a numerical artifact, but it, it really comes out of the formula that um, when you take, you know, the, the, that limit, it will actually converge to that particular shape. All right, so that uh, was one thing about um, uh, application of the, of the, uh, the one, one exact solution of the KPC equation. And uh, now I want to come to, sort of to another totally different topic, which uh, now it's usually called integrable probability. I mean, you see, this is sort of, in some sense, you know, the, the, the birth of that field. I mean, you know, the way how, why this field sort of came into focus is very, very much related with the KPC equation. I mean. Uh, it was sort of, you know, it was sort of realized that, 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 that these kind of things, I mean, you know, that uh, there are mathematical objects which are now called sort of integral probability, but it was sort of initiated by the KPC equation. And what I would like to show you is just sort of one thing, simple example. You know, there would be, you know, many more, more things to say, but, but I think this example sort of, sort of tells you roughly, you know, what is, what is meant by, by, by these words of integral probability. And the example which I'm using is a very familiar problem from statistical mechanics, which is sort of a, 
the six vertex model and and which is sort of the paradigm of an of an integrable model i mean you know this is something you know you have uh, i mean the young baxter and 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 leave and you know many people actually studied this uh, this model and, uh, and 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 sort of uh, you know and, okay so uh, you have young baxter equations and uh, you have all, all this sort of integrable structure which which you know from from integrable quantum systems anyway so so now now let me focus sort of more on the statistical aspect so so what you have is sort of uh, like a square and and you want to tile it uh, with so you have tiles and you have sort of a domain which you want to type which i should say like a little box here and you have six tiles i mean so this is the six vertex model and you have a sort of a, a tile where you have sort of a cross and then there's uh, simply no line whatsoever you know a horizontal and then and, and a vertical and horizontal line and then sort of a little hook and you give them statistical weights i mean these have weight a these b and these have c and uh, uh, you impose i mean for the tiling you know you're, you're not just allowed to start immediately i mean you have to satisfy the boundary condition so you have this sort of incoming line over here and here there's no line and so here i've showed you sort of one admissible tile which you can sort of add because it sort of satisfies the boundary condition but now you have to sort of fill up uh, everything uh, and of course you have to fill it up i mean when i mean by tiling you what i mean is that you have to fill it up in such a way that that you know the line which you generate sort of continues all the way from from the left uh, uh, side always to the to the to the upper uh, edge Okay, and so what you will see if you do many of those things is that you see sort of uh, here sort of uh, tiles which sort of inherit what they see from the boundary. Um, but then after a while, you know, this, this sort of uh, is not so optimal anymore. And then in fact, you will see sort of a, a middle region which uh, is, is called, uh, you know, it's a disordered region. I mean, you know, you don't see any particular dominance of tiles. It's sort of like more random mixture. Actually, I put this down here. I mean, it's 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 actually uh, uh, what I call here disordered. I mean, it's actually critical disordered. I mean, you know, the correlations are long range. It's, it's really a Gaussian. I mean, you know, the, the the height field which is sort of constructed from this. I mean, these are the level lines of of a height function, and and the the the, the height field, two dimensional height field, which is sort of uh, comes from these level lines, is actually a, a Gaussian feel this mass here so, so it's actually critical but anyway i mean this is sort of not not really what what the kpc equation uh, wants to study you know the kpc equation you see now it's, it's sort of somewhat similar than what we had before i mean you have sort of a, a domain and you have a fluctuating border and now, now you wonder what is the cross dynamics but the cross dynamics is actually quite simple in this case i mean you know so of course people had to figure out i mean this was sort of not anticipated but uh, the cross dynamics just simply means that you know you start with a with a, a squares of size n and then you have sort of you know the, the particular statistics but then you simply increase the size to n plus one and then you see that this of course then v, v ranges you know what is the edge and then you get sort of you know the the, the edge statistics at time one and so uh, you know in this way i mean you get actually something which is very similar to the cross dynamics okay now um uh, the fact that it's in the KPC universality class was, was a very famous paper by Kurt Johansson, which was, you know, in 2000, this is sort of, you know, laid the foundation to what people call integrable, integrable probability. And, and, and what he actually proved is that when you, when you now look at, you know, just like what we had before in the experiment, I mean, you look at the fluctuations of that edge. So this is sort of like like a one point function. Then he proved that, that you know the edge fluctuations are of size n to the one third. That's the analog of the time which we had before, and uh, a universal uh, uh, you know random amplitude, which is a universal distribution, which is again the GUE random uh, the Tracy Widom distribution. Now, why could uh, Kurt do this? Uh, of course, he didn't know about this, but you know when you uh, when you actually you look a little bit further, then you realize that he was studying, he, he came from a different corner. I mean, so, so you know, the notion of Fermion presumably didn't mean very much to him. But when you look at his work, you know, in retrospect, what he actually did, I mean, he wisely picked this parameter delta in such a way that, that, that the delta is equal to zero, which actually corresponds to the free Fermion point of the six vertex model. And so once you have the free Fermion point, it's clear that you should get sort of, you know, more information. I mean, so in particular, you know, if you work hard enough, I mean, you should get the Tracy-Widom distribution. And you, if you work even more, 
you should also get the multi-point distribution. So not only the distribution at one, the height at one single point, but you also, you know, what is the full statistics of this line? And that's something which at the time we called the area two process. This is related to, and, and uh, this, this is related to, to, the, to the lateral correlation lengths, which goes like into the two thirds, okay? Now, uh, this topic has been sort of, I mean, you know, this integrable probability is, is, a, is this huge topic. I mean, I just was at the, at the workshop at the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute where many people were interested in such things and, you know, more and more things are coming. So this is sort of like the continuous sort of, uh, sort of, how do you want to say, sort of a branch off of the KPC equation you know, which has sort of living its own life with its own methods and all their own, own type of uh, interests. Okay. So one thing which 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 interests them and which sort of uh, sort of a uh, sort of very fascinating open problem, of course, is to go beyond the free fermion point to actually sort of um, look at at um, at um, um, you know at, uh, away from the free fermion point where the model is still integrable, but you know it's much more complicated. And so one case which which people studied or study, I mean, the moment is uh, is the so-called ice point where you put all the uh, all the weights equal to one. So it's just a completely uniform tiling. All of them have, have weight one. And, and so the delta is one half. So we are away from the pre-fermions. Now, um, uh, the limit shape is something which, which uh, I mean, people like, uh, uh, I mean, uh, um, can be proved, but, uh, but um, um, uh, the, the fluctuations, you know, I guess to be KPC, but, but uh, at the moment we, we just can sort of point at, uh, at, at um, at the numerics, which I will show you in a second, um, I only want to sort of uh, remind you that, that that this also can be seen as a, as um, a problem uh, of crystals. I mean, so this is uh, you know just equilibrium statistical mechanics of of, of crystals, and uh, what we are looking at, if you use the language of crystals, would be you know this is sort of uh, a smooth part of the crystal. I mean, it's sort of rounded. And the things over here are actually facets. And so what this kind of consideration also predict that if I look at the crystal in thermal equilibrium, and if I look at the facet, which is sort of planar, and if I look at the edge of the facet, it should be again governed by the tracy rhythm distribution as, and, and should be connected to the KPC equation. All right, so now let me show you the numerics um, uh, of, of uh, this kind of thing. So, so what you will see is just, uh, you know, basically, you know, the, this kind of quantity. I mean, so the simulation uh, is actually uh, uh, somewhat difficult, but um, what is plotted is, is basically, you know, the, the scaling is perfect. And what is plotted is, uh, is uh, the distribution of, 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 of this, uh, of the random shape. Okay, so let me first give you a better picture of, of what it looks like. So here, you know, I have a somewhat, uh, uh, so you see here the limit shape. I mean, this, this is, this is the, 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 the line which is described by the KPC equation. And this is the cross process. So if you go from n to n plus one, I will, I will see a new line. And, and when you sort of study more precisely, you know, it doesn't look so much different from the task. I mean, it's sort of more complicated, but sort of has the same spirit. And you can see here that this ordered region, so you see that these lines sort of, you know, uh, are, are sort of, you know, they don't have any sort of particular structure. Uh, and, and here you see sort of the, the perfectly ordered uh, four corners and uh, we, we can sort of concentrate on either one of them. I mean, there's perfect symmetry here. Okay. And so here are numerical results. Uh, first at the free fermion point. So that's just for various sizes and these are, you know, what, what, what is the logarithmic plot of the, of the Tracy Witham distribution? And of course, you know, it's a theorem. I mean, so the better the computer, you know, we're going to, to rather small numbers. I mean, the, the computer better sort of reproduces that, but this comes out beautifully. But if you go to the, to the ice point, you see it's now, it's, it's more complicated. And then uh, you, uh, you have to use different simulation techniques. So the size is, is limited, but you know, over the available size, of course, <coughs> you know, <coughs> it's the same, it's the same picture. I mean, and uh, on that basis, you know, you're absolutely convinced that uh, when you would look at these kind of uh, shape fluctuations uh, for these type of models, you really, you know, not only at the free fermion point, but, but at any different delta, we will see uh, the tracy rhythm distribution.
Okay. All right. So I think I'm sort of doing pretty well with the time. So I have one, one final slide, which, which I would like to explain to you, uh, which is sort of now very much on the theoretical side. Uh, but but uh, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it relates to, to, you know, similar attempts in, in other problems in statistical mechanics. And so, so it might be useful to actually look at this uh, uh, in a little bit, uh, you know, sort of more carefully. So, so this is something which sort of happened around 2019. I mean, it's, it's a group of Quassel, uh, three other people worked on this for years. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's ongoing work. But, but so I just want to give you, give you the, the flavor. And, and, and here, so you should look first at, look at, at this little diagram over here. So you see what, what we argue is that we have the KPC equation. And of course, you know, we do the scaling. I mean, and then you get to, you expect the universal properties out of the KPC equation. So this is what is then called the KPC fixed point, okay? Now you see our information is not complete. I mean, for instance, uh, you know, this the fluctuations, uh, uh, you know, at the two point functions at the same time. I mean, that's something which, which uh, uh, we don't really know how to prove, but, but, you know, we are convinced that it's also in the KPC equation, but, but, you know, nobody has really expected it. But you could also look at two times. So you could, could, could look at many things. And, and, and uh, of course, you would think that, you know, all of these sort of under the proper scaling will go to a particular fixed point field theory. And the question is, what is the structure of this field theory, right? And now if you start with the KPC equation, we don't really know how to do that. But if you start with the discrete model, I mean, this is what, what Clark Russell and company did, then uh, you actually can prove, I mean, you can actually show what is the structure of the fixed point, which is very unusual in terms of statistical mechanics. I mean, because you said statistical mechanics to get the full fixed point theory is sort of, you know, usually a rather difficult goal to reach. Anyway, so um, um, th th there's another limit which people sort of investigated and where there's a lot of effort and there, where there are many models for which you can actually do this is you can also uh, try to sort of take a, a limit where you go from the TASEP, which is discrete space time to the continuum PD. But for this, you have to actually look at the case of big asymmetry rather than just sort of, you know, adding every use once in a while, you also have to remove squares and then if you do this sort of, you know, in a, in a big balanced state, then uh, and, and scale space time, then you actually converge to the KPC equation. So, so this part is extremely well studied. I mean, lots, lots of models where we know that they go to the continuum uh, equation, whereas for the fixed point, you know, it's basically only for the TASIP when we have the full information. And so now I am using another three minutes. I mean, now let me just sort of explain you a little bit what, what, what you do. I mean, first of all, you really have to do space time scaling. And that's what people call the one, two, three scaling of the KPC equation. So, so the height is of order, that, that's the scaling parameter of epsilon to the minus one half. The space is of order epsilon to the minus one and the time is of order epsilon to the minus three half. And you do this rescaling, which of course you find already in the original paper of, of, uh, of Giorgio. Um, you find that, that the rescaled equation is made in such a way that this nonlinearity stays and this is of order epsilon. So you might think that this sort of goes away completely and you get just the equation of this, you know, you, you just get equations, uh, I mean, you just get the deterministic equation, uh, which only has the nonlinearity. But that's, uh, that's not really what actually happens. It's sort of much more complicated. And this equation has many solutions. And so, you know, this cannot work. But rather you should think of this sort of like, like a somewhat subtle noise term which determines which kind of equations you, you, you will get from the deterministic part, right? Anyway, so um, what they prove is something which is sort of conceptually quite simple, namely you do the scaling and you realize that, you know, you start from something which is a stochastic PD or, or in the discrete case, if, you know, you have a, a given Markov transition probability and now they basically show that, you know, whatever, you know, any multi-time, any multi-space, uh, distribution uh, will have a limit. I mean, so, you know, you take here at the same time at different points, I mean, you will get a determinable expression. And uh, since it's Markov, you can also do in principle things, uh, you know, at later times, because you can just use the fact that, uh, you know, you, you do, you, you iterate the transition probability, then you get the time dependent behavior. And so in that way, you get, you know, you completely circumvent any one of these equations you get directly the fixed point equation. Now, of course, to extract information from the fixed point equation might be very difficult. And, and but some of them are very easy. If you want to get from the fixed point equation just the Tracy-Witham distribution, I mean, this is something we should do in two lines now. 
Uh, other things are more complicated and people are working it. But the idea is that rather than, you know, sort of studying it approximating equations, why don't we study directly uh, the fixed point and uh, then you find lots of surprising connections to other integrable PDEs and uh, well, it's a whole world by itself. So let me let me uh, leave a little bit of time for questions. So, so I have here uh, still a final slide which I wanted to, to mention. Um, uh, I have, of course, I should have said more about this integral probability, but but uh, you know this would lead us so far. But there's an, one other element which I do have to mention, namely it's it's the Fields Medal of, of Martin Hyva. I mean, he his famous paper is called solving the KPC equation. Now, of course, he didn't solve the KPC equation, but he had sort of another aspect in his mind. When you look at this equation, you know, it's very singular because uh, you have this white noise, which is singular, and then you have, you know, the, the derivative uh, squared of a function h, which is very simple, is singular, and, and you don't really know what this derivative means, and you don't know, know even less what the square means. And so, but what, what, what Martin became interested because it's sort of a nice example for him to study single or stochastic PDEs. I mean, he was not so much interested in, in the, the kind of, you know, things which I was telling you, but, but for him looking at an equation which sort of, you know, had some applications, but it was sort of singular, but not too singular, was sort of uh, an enormous uh, motivation to develop a, a rather general theory of how to deal with such kind of a singular stochastic uh, PDEs and you know the mathematics community acknowledge that work uh, you know on the highest level and so it's, it's a very different direction I mean it's basically sort of understanding you know what is the ultraviolet behavior of, of the KPC equation rather than what I did all the time understanding what what are the predictions of the KPC equation on very large scales I mean that is where you see the universe universality he, he was interested in the behavior of that equation at very short distances and how to make sense out of this sort of, uh, you know, out of the formulas. Okay, there's another thing which, which I should mention is that, you know, versions of multi-component KPC and of course, you know, the KPC uh, in higher dimensions, which uh, is another sort of um, uh, open and interesting topic. So concluding the talk, I mean, you know, I would like to thank you, Giorgio, for uncovering the KPC equation. It's certainly, you know, had a very, very strong impact, in particularly on the probabilistic community and otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herbert. Uh, we have some uh, time for questions. So if any of you have questions, you could raise your hand uh, well, and, and I can unmute yourself. Uh, while we wait, uh, Herbert, maybe I could, you know, there's something that I wanted to ask, ask you while I take a look at the questions. So could you uh, sort of, you know, briefly comment on the higher dimensional thing? I mean, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that you uh, won't be touching uh, on no, uh, no, but I want, in want two or three say, dimensions. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to say is, you know, that this strong probabilistic uh, impact is, of course, uh, well, okay. No, there are no, there are also higher dimensions in uh, you can do directed polymers in higher dimensions. I mean, so so no. I mean, maybe I, I should be more careful of what I want to say here. I mean, what I want to say is that that uh, you know many. I, I mean, there, there's one natural. Okay, so so you know what you mean by higher dimensions sort of uh, depends a little bit on on you know what what kind of uh, picture you have of the KPC and. Uh, one, one, one thing on which there are lots of results in, in higher dimensions is uh, when you go, which I didn't explain very much, when you go to the picture of the directed polymer, you know, then, then uh, so this is a directed polymer which is sitting in, in, in a random potential. And that of course, you know, has a natural extension to, to higher dimensions, which corresponds mm -hmm. exactly to the higher dimensional KPC equation. Uh, and and uh, on this, there, there, are, there are lots of studies, but uh, you know, there, there's nothing like exact solutions, for instance. I mean, you know, it's sort of like going from, from you know, two-dimensional statistical mechanics where you have conformal invariance and all kind of mathematical structures which are behind. When you go to the three-dimensional Ising model, you're just, you know, stuck with that model and have to try to figure out that, right? I mean, so, so I guess this is what, 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 uh, what I was sort of trying to say about higher dimensions, but then, uh, you know, there is a large body. I mean, there are also experiments, uh, you know, there are lots of numerical things uh, and, and um, I just, you know, it would be too much to, to add it to what I had already. Sure, sure. yeah, okay. Uh, so a uh, question, Roberto, uh, 
uh, and then Abhishek, I come to you. Roberto, if you can unmute yourself. And... Okay, yeah. uh, Herbert, thank you very much for your very nice uh, <clears throat> um, talk. I want just to ask you a simple question about the last uh, slides where you mentioned the singular stochastic CDE. Yes. Now, from the physical point of view, uh, the results that was got, uh, that was obtained, does change anything about the behavior of KPZ on the large scale, or you have to renormalize some way the starting uh, stochastic differential equation? No, 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 nothing has changed. No, no, no nothing has changed whatsoever. The only point is that we want to have a more complete information. You see, it's like like saying when when you do uh, you know an icing model and then now you you know something about the, this you know at the critical point and you know something about the two point function that's fine but now maybe you want to know something about the four point function maybe on the six eight point function and etc cetera, etc cetera. you want to sort of know you know all all the you know the, the limiting behavior of all possible correlation functions and, and this this is what what is meant here by the fixed point right mm -hmm. in okay you know in principle you know this limiting formula covers all universal, you know, every potentially, you know, universal uh, object you, you, you might want to know. Of course, you know, it's sort of not in a very explicit form. So you have to work in order to get something which you can really use. But, but, but the main point is that, no, no, nothing has changed. It's just trying to really get, uh, uh, you know, basically all correlation functions. Uh, I mean, the, the, the universal content of, of the correlation functions, right? Okay, thank you. But, uh, Abhishek, uh, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah. Abhishek. Yes, so Herbert had two questions. So one was, I mean, this, uh, so this KPZ in this integrable quantum spin chains has been seen for now some time. I mean, so is there uh, any understanding at all, like why you see the, uh, I mean, KPZ behavior? Uh, well, okay. Uh, okay, that's a good question. Let, let, let me stay at the line. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, yes, no, no, I mean, in, in fact, uh, you know, we are, we are sort of uh, producing a, a special volume on, on, on generalized um, uh, hydrodynamics. I mean, you know, there, there has been a lot of work on, on that, uh, which, uh, which uh, you know, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Bultadani has theories. I mean, uh, Jacobo Dinadis has sort of, uh, you know, similar theories. I mean, there is sort of, uh, on the physics level, I would think that they are, uh, you know, actually fairly, fairly um, convincing uh, arguments why we should uh, see the KPC behavior. And there's also discussion, you know, how much, you know, is, is, is it really so important that the underlying quantum mechanical model is, uh, is integrable or maybe, you know, you see something similar for the non-integrable case and it, it's a long story. I mean, you know, the, the, if, you, if you look at the last two years, they are presumably sort of like, like you know, I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. So now I think that there is a sort of, by now, there is sort of, you know, at the beginning, it was a real surprise in, in, in 2019, I, I think, you know, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was sort of more, more like, you know, convincing numerical observation, but now we have sort of a rather convincing theory, I would say. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Abhishek, uh, Abhishek, you had a quick question? Yes, yeah. because there's also... Uh, that is, yeah. I mean, uh, this, uh, you showed these uh, experiments of Takeuchi on the Tracy Vidam. Uh, are there also experiments uh, which actually verify the KPZ scaling functions directly? Um, you mean other experiments? No, yeah. So this is the Tracy Vidam, which is the uh, for the let's say the largest value. Well, but the I mean, scaling function. So, so I mean, what what Takeuchi did also was originally had the, the GUE and the GOE. I mean, so that was uh, you know, I mean, the growing droplet and the flat surface. And then uh, it took a long time, but but when you sort of look like three years ago, uh, he eventually realized. To also do the, the 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 stationary KPC. I mean, that was sort of that sort of was you know this, the, the the third universal distribution uh, which you which I showed you. And uh, I mean, this took a long time because you see that the idea for the for the stationary case is that you would have to start with initial data which are actually like a random walk. And so you so how how in the experiment do you tell you know how do you produce a seed which is sort of like a random walk? And that, that's something which, which took him a, a long time to, to do, you know, at sufficient precision 
that you can uh, actually get good data. But but uh, yeah, th these are available. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Titi, you had a question? Uh, yeah, let me unmute you. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm a bit of an outsider to this field, so it might be a, a stupid question. But is there a physical intuition towards uh, why do we need the double exponential when we compute the generating function? And if so, then is it the same for, say, the case of the Fisher KPP equation, where also you need the same sort of technique? Well, uh, look, I mean, I mean, you know, this this is this is part of the invention, so to speak, right? I mean, you, know, you dis discover that that you know you you do a Generating function, you discover that you know a single exponential suffices, right? And and uh, and uh, and then then you are sort of quite happy, and you teach your students so that that's a good way to sort of write down generating functions. And the fact that you know the generating function, you know, happens to have this sort of complicated form, uh, uh, you know, this this is end of, of of a long argument. I mean, you know, it was you know eventually. I mean, I, I don't think there's any any quick or even intuitive way. Of seeing it, I mean, you should think of this sort of as a final result of a somewhat sort of a, you know uh, lengthy and involved uh, computation, right? It's right. Nothing, but, nothing uh, but and 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 it relies very heavily on on previous results. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so uh, Herbert, you're around. So maybe you know after all the talks and give there's more discussion, we can take it up there. But. Uh, let's uh, thank Herbert for a wonderful talk. 